Good morning. Good morning to all of you in the sanctuary this morning. And also greetings to all of our viewers who are watching us right now through our YouTube channel. It's truly a privilege that I am able to share God's word with all of you. Thank you for joining us this morning. So we are about to come to the end of Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. And in exactly two weeks, we will be starting a new series and we will be starting the second letter to the Thessalonians. But today, but today we will be continuing our study on 1 Thessalonians. And today we'll be looking at chapter 5, verse 12 to verse 15. But before we open God's word, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you this morning and we thank you. We thank you for all the blessings you continue to give to us. We thank you for your love, for your grace, for your mercy. Father, we thank you that you have chosen us to be your very own. And Lord, Father, we pray that at this time, as we are about to open your word. We pray that you will prepare our hearts, that the Holy Spirit in us will guide our thoughts. Father, we pray that you will help us to set aside the distractions that we may have. Oh Lord, you know some of the problems or the hardships, the struggles that we have right now. But Father, we pray that you will help us to dedicate this time to you and only you right now. So Lord, I pray that you will help us to hear your voice. Help us to seek your face. Help us to obey your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So, as a brief recap, last week we learned that the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly and it will come unannounced like a thief in the night. Paul encouraged the Thessalonian Christians and also to us that we are the children of light and that we are to be ready and to be disciplined as we wait for Jesus' return. So as we get to the last part of Paul's letter. He now gives us an overview about what the life of a mature believer should look like and how we can faithfully practice all the biblical principles that he has taught us in our daily life. So as we listen and study today's scripture, May we also think and we also reflect about our own life in the areas we need to grow. Let's read this together. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to give recognition to those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you and to regard them very highly in love because of their work be at peace among yourselves and we exhort you brothers and sisters warn those who are idle comfort the discouraged help the weak be patient with everyone See to it that no one repays evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue 
what is good for one another and for all. So let's go back to verse 12. It says, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to give recognition to those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you. Paul says to the Thessalonians, you as Christians, you are to give recognition to those who labor and lead you in the Lord and admonish you. So according to Paul, we are to recognize those who labor among us. Now the word labor here means to serve. So Paul says we are to recognize those, not by their title, but those who are serving. And also, second, those who lead you in the Lord. This means we are to recognize the church leaders who are providing leadership to the congregation. And, and just as a sheep is to follow its shepherd, God also had put in place leaders in the church to lead the congregation in the Lord. Not from their own teachings, but in the Lord's teachings. And third, we are to recognize those who admonish. So this word admonish, I know it's not a very common word in daily conversation, but it means to caution or to warn. It's similar to walking in an indoor hallway of a building and someone had just finished mopping the floor. The warning would be like the sign that's placed on the floor. It cautions the danger of walking carelessly instead of walking carefully. Now, every single one of us know of people who have dedicated their own time, they have dedicated their energy and their, and their extreme dedication to serve, to lead, and to even warn us in the Lord. It could be our pastors, Sunday school teachers, ministry leaders, or even our volunteers. And I can even tell you that even ministry leaders and pastors, they've had other teachers, or they've had pastors, or they've had their own mentors who have helped them. So this passage that Paul is speaking of is applicable to every one of us. We are all to recognize all those who serve, all those who lead, and all those who warn us of our sins. Now, what this does not mean is that if you're a Christian leader or you're a volunteer, whoever you may be, whoever's serving in the church, and that you're doing all of these things in order to be recognized. We're not purposely being involved in being in, involved in so many different ministries or fellowships as we can, just so that we can be noticed by other people. First Peter chapter five, verse five says, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders. And the word elders meaning leaders. And all of you dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. 
The key word here is humility. And this is in contrast to desiring to be recognized by other people. So knowing that we are to recognize our church leaders and to recognize the volunteers, to recognize the members who want to serve and who may want to warn us about our sins, the question is, how do we go about doing that? How do we recognize these people? So let's look at verse 13. Paul says, And to regard them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. So Paul says we need to regard them very highly. Why? Because of their work. The work they are doing in the church. So not only are we to value and to love our leaders or of, of our volunteers because of the work they do, we are also to be at peace at how they're doing that. It doesn't mean that if you didn't like the leader's ideas or you didn't like one of the volunteers, the way of how they did things, it is a reason for us to criticize them because that's how friction may arise. And this will lead to the members taking sides. And in the process, what will happen is that the church will become unsettled. However, if all the members hold their leaders in high regard, peace will characterize the church. That's what Paul is trying to say. I want all of you to picture this for a moment. All of you. That you are a newly married wife. And for the guys, please imagine that you are a newly married wife as well. So picture you being a newly married wife who knows very little about cooking. Because when you were single, you didn't do a lot of cooking for yourself. But now as a married woman, you, you try to take it upon yourself to learn how to cook. So you buy these pots and pans, some, of you, some utensils and some appliances, and you start researching some recipes that you think that your husband would like. So you spend the whole afternoon carefully preparing and also researching recipes on the internet. And as your husband comes back home, he says, where's my dinner? Why is it not ready yet? You know what time I come home. I'm hungry. So as you are finishing up researching and preparing the meal and when it is time to serve the meal you both sit down and you both take a bite of the new recipe you had just made and after taking a couple of bites your husband mumbles this doesn't taste so good. I don't know. It, it just doesn't suit me. I think I'm going to order a pizza. And in spite of all your efforts, you try to be an understanding wife. And you try to really 
understand how your husband feels. But truth be told, even the most gracious and the most understanding wife would really struggle having to face this type of attitude from her own husband. Especially if this happens quite often. See, even as husbands, even if we know whatever our wife is doing may not be what we expected or even desired, we should still show appreciation to them. Church, we need to show appreciation for the unpaid workers in the church. We need to show appreciation to the lay leaders, the volunteers, even if they don't do everything you want them to or that you've expected them to. And when you can do that and to be encouraging instead of being critical towards them, that's how you can be at peace among yourselves. This is what Paul is saying. We are to be encouraging and to value our leaders and the members who serve. And when we do that, we will be at peace among ourselves. So Paul continues and he gives another instruction. Verse 14 and verse 15. He says, And we exhort you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle. Comfort the discouraged. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. See to it that no one repays evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for one another and for all. So let's go back to verse 14. Paul says, we also exhort you. The exhort here means that we are to tell someone what they must do. It means to tell someone urgently that they need to do this. So according to Paul, there are four responsibilities that we and the Thessalonians are to do. Number one, we are to warn those who are idle. Number two, we are to comfort the discouraged. And number three, we are to help the weak. And number four, we are to be patient with everyone. So the Bible says we are to warn those who are idle. Now this word warn is similar to admonish. But again, it's asking all of us to warn those who are idle. And the word idle is actually means the ones who are lazy. And we actually talked about this a few weeks ago. We talked about laziness being a sin. Again, there were some Thessalonians who were taking advantage of the other Christians who were serving night and day. And essentially, as we see here, they were being idle. Basically, they're just sitting there doing nothing. That's what idle means. And just like a leader is to warn the church members about certain things or about certain sins that may be persisting. Again, we're not talking about being critical, but we are just talking about warning those who are doing those things. And the same applies here 
all of us. We are to warn those who are idle. So number two, we are also to comfort the discouraged. Now this word discouraged, when Paul wrote this, he was actually referring to those who are grieving because their loved ones had passed away. And we also talked about this um, a few weeks ago too as well, that Christians are not to grieve the same way as others. Others meaning the non-Christians who have no hope. And number three, we are to help the weak. And the word weak doesn't mean that you used to could carry 100 pounds, but now you can only carry 20 pounds. It doesn't mean physically how much you can exert in terms of your strength. And therefore now, because you can't, you have become weak. This is not what Paul is trying to say. He's actually referring to those who were faced with temptations. Those who may be involved in sin and they're trying to separate themselves away from their sins, but they can't. That, that's their struggle. And this is the weak that Paul is referring to. And number four, we are to be patient. With who? It says with everyone. Not just the ones who are worthy of our patience but also the ones that might be very difficult to deal with. The Bible says we are to be patient with everyone. Now, in case we have forgotten how to be patient, I've listed here some examples for us to follow. It means, patience means we are not to roll our eyes. It means that we are not to sigh. It means we are not to complain to others about this or about that. It means we are not to raise our voice. We are not to interrupt. We are not to yell and we are not to stop listening. And we are not to be looking at our watch constantly and looking at the time wondering when something would be over or when something would be finished. Those are the things that show us that we are impatient. So if you notice anything on this list that you think or you may feel that you have done or you, you continue to do, it is likely a sign that you need to grow in the area of patience. So next time when you struggle with this, remember how patient God is with you. And you need to come to him in prayer and to ask for his strength and for his grace and to show you real patience. Let's move on to verse 15. Paul says, See to it, that no one repays evil for evil to anyone. But always pursue what is good for one another and for all. In this verse, Paul is actually instructing us not to seek payback or to get even when someone commits something offensive against us but rather we are to pursue what is good for one another, not just to our Christian brothers and sisters, but for all, meaning everybody, including non-Christians. In Romans chapter 12, verse 17 and verse 19, Paul says, do not repay anyone evil for evil, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. 
for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. See, we have to believe that God will address any wrongdoing. The Lord says, it is mine to avenge. This is God speaking. I will repay, not us, but the Lord. Christians, instead of looking for an opportunity to pay back our offenders, we need to look for opportunities to forgive and to bless them. This is what Paul is saying. We pursue what is good for one another and for everyone. Paul says that we must always pursue after what is good for them. And this word always tells us that we cannot, we cannot pick and choose when or to whom we will do this. It doesn't depend on who did evil to us. It doesn't depend on how many times they did it to us. It doesn't depend on how much it hurts. It doesn't matter who they are or what they've done. God wants us to always pursue. Meaning that we keep on striving and striving and striving. What is good for them? Each and every time. I know it's not going to be easy, but it has to be our goal. This is what God wants. And this is what God's church does. And I believe that this is something that we should all learn in San Francisco Mandarin Baptist Church and also any Christians who, who is watching this, so that we too, just as the Thessalonians, that we can help each other grow as God's children and to mature, to become the church that God wants us to be. Maybe you too, want to pursue others' goods. But maybe you say, you're not a Christian yet. But first, you need to be forgiven and you need to change so that you will know where to point people to so that they too can be forgiven and can be changed. And you can only do that by believing in Jesus today. Let me invite you to do that and to be a part of God's church. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for taking people like us who are so self-centered, so sinful in so many ways. And yet, you, because of your grace, you have called us to be your own. You have called us to be your children. Lord, we thank you for what Jesus had done for us, that he died on the cross for us, for our sins. But Lord, we also need to make that decision to take that step of faith and to believe in Him and to know in our hearts that He died for us, but he, that He also rose on the third day, conquering death for all of us. So Lord, I pray that 
you will help us to pursue what is good for others. Help us to appreciate our leaders, the volunteers who serve, the members who may warn others and warn us out of their love and in the Lord. So Father, I pray that you will help us with all of these things, all of these areas. And Lord, if there's anyone here who have yet to make that decision to be a Christian, Father, I pray that you will reveal yourself to them and that you will soften their hearts. Please let them know that they are also can be the chosen ones, that they can be your children as well. And Lord, as we now prepare our tithes and offering, and as we want to give because you are so faithful to us, help us to realize that everything that we have is from you. And may we, may we continue to give out of our love so that we can help and pursue the good of others. We continue to pray that this will be used so that the gospel of Jesus Christ will continue to flourish until the ends of the earth. Lord, we thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.